Hello everyone and thank you for joining our webinar today on Blue Hour Photography and PaintShop Pro. During this webinar you'll learn all about what exactly Blue Hour Photography is as well as editing and processing tips to create the effect in PaintShop Pro. I'm pleased to be joined by our newest member of the PaintShop Professionals program, George Kurzik. George is a professional photographer with a keen eye and enjoys capturing wide angle images and cityscapes, trees, bridges, and landscapes. His style is based on long exposure coupled with HDR, and he's been relying on PaintShop Pro to help perfect his photographs and compositions for many years. Before I hand it over to George, I want to remind you that this webinar will be recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you tomorrow in a follow-up email. As a special thank you for attending the webinar today, I'd also like to offer you a 25% discount off the purchase or upgrade of PaintShop Pro 2020 Ultimate. The code to redeem this offer will be in the follow-up email tomorrow as well, so keep an eye out for that email. Well, that takes care of all the items from me, so now we'll go ahead and pass it over to George. Well, hello everybody, this is George Kurzik and Carly, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Uh, today I'll talk about, as Carly intimated, uh, Blue Hour Photography. Um, it, it sounds like a, a very difficult subject, but it really isn't, and PageHop Pro makes it very easy, actually. Uh, what I'm going to go through today is a, a PowerPoint presentation, and we're going to do some practical exercises as well. Uh, you'll notice this is my uh, starter slide. I'm assuming that's coming up on everybody's screen. Uh, and that's my website, flickr.com, Photos Kurzik. Everything you see today is available there. And everything you see today is something that you all can do. I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, after this presentation, uh, you'll be able to uh, practice some of these techniques. And uh, please feel free to ask questions uh, through Carly. I'm, I'm happy to answer anything that may uh, come out of this. Here's today's agenda. I'm going to go through the introduction and discuss what is Blue Hour Photography and some of its components. I've also selected about a dozen, uh, what I call the dirty dozen, of uh, some of my images that we will review uh, compositionally and technically to give you an idea what, what I look for in, in a su in subject matter. Then I'll talk about the tools and techniques you'll need to conduct uh, this kind of photography and and then also how we process it in PaintShop Pro, both from an HDR perspective as well as normal uh, finishing and editing. So what's Blue Hour? Well, you always see lots of sunsets uh, and sunrises and that's that's considered the red hour or the the, the golden hour, excuse me. Uh, but the blue hour is the time of the day that's about 30 minutes at, before sunrise and about 15 to 30 minutes after the sunset. And uh, it creates a distinct blue cast in the sky. And, and what I like about it, <clears throat> as opposed to, say, uh, night photography, is you can still get a lot of textures and details in, in the subjects that are in the picture. Uh, in this example, we, we see the clouds, we see the buildings, and this is this one particularly was shot about uh, about 30 minutes before sunrise. So, uh, in night photography, uh, you're looking at cityscapes, landscapes, but typically the skies are usually close to black, and some of the foreground images are very dark. I like to try and capture them when there's ambient light. Here's some of the techniques I use. Uh, there's a number of things I'm going to try and convey and, and try to help you understand. And, uh, and I'll keep this relatively simple and uh, not belabor too many points. First thing I want to do is we underst understand the trade between shutter speed and aperture. Um, when you're in blue hour photography or even night photography, we're looking at longer exposures, uh, sometimes you know, very long exposure, so when, uh, which is what we're looking for. 
and and sometimes to get those long exposures we have to control our aperture try and get smaller apertures instead of wide open so it, it's always good to understand the trade between uh, uh, the shutter speed you're going to use and the apertures particularly if you're using wide angle lenses uh, uh, to try and capture the entire uh, landscape if you will uh, another thing that I do again for HDR is I take five images of every uh, final image that I produce so five image what's called bracketing and uh, I'll explain that as we get into the presentation a little bit but basically uh, it's exposure bracketing that that uh, creates five images uh, each with a different exposure long time exposures as I mentioned earlier try and go from 1 through 30 seconds uh, reason for the long exposures well it's going to be dark in the sky uh, not totally dark but uh, dark enough where we're going to need longer times and again I like to use long exposures to get the texture in the skies uh, moving clouds moving water from shooting rivers uh, that kind of thing uh, you'll see this when we do the image review uh, ISO uh, that's the sensitivity setting of the camera uh, and go from very low to very high intuitively a lot of people who go for night photography think you have to set your camera to a very high ISO and if you're <clears throat> hand holding that that is important but I almost always go to the very lowest I can set my camera reason being uh, when you process uh, for high dynamic range uh, the lower the ISO the less noise you'll get when you go through the processing for the high dynamic range processing uh, also low, to me low, low ISO produces I think sharper images uh, less noise <clears throat> and again when I go low I low ISO I can get the longest exposure I can again I'm I'm a fan of low, of very long exposures uh, and of course finally the high dynamic range processing this is the, uh, the the technique of combining your five bracketed images uh, into one images and what high dynamic range does it effectively captures the shadows uh, such that it brings out the shadows and and the and the darker areas while uh, also preventing the blowouts that you would have with the high uh, or the highly exposed areas in any image. Again, I'll walk through these when we do our uh, review of the images. Let's do a let's take a look at some of these, and uh, I'll take a I'll tell you what what I think the things you need to look for and some of the stronger uh, points of each one. Some compositional tips for any image that I'm that I'm looking at out in the field, and and all of my images I do a lot of planning I, I like to go to Google Maps uh, I, I look for locations where I get a good vantage point I also uh, I'm I'm also a bridge junkie I tend to shoot a lot of bridges a lot of structures I always get good reflections good lighting but some of the tips that uh, apply that I apply to myself and, and are, are just good photographic tips in general uh, rule of thirds uh, this is the 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 sort of pseudo rule where any main subject should really be off center somewhere in the thirds of your image whether whether it's across the horizontal plane or the vertical uh, you try and get leading lines that kind of bring the eye to where you want it to rest on your main subject in this case we have the leading line of the bridge uh, and also uh, the uh, clouds in long exposure act as leading lines itself texture uh, I never go out shooting when I don't have clouds in the sky that's that's just a personal preference of mine again the, to me clouds lend texture to the background uh, here's something a lot of people might not be familiar with I call it anchoring I like to have foreground in a lot of my pictures because it just anchors the picture uh, this would be a great image without this here uh, but I think at having the uh, trees in the foreground just anchor the picture to to uh, and give this all perspective as well 
So let's walk through the dozen pictures I have. I'm not going to try and spend too much time on them. Uh, here's a picture that was done on the, the Delaware River outside of Philadelphia. Uh, again, uh, blue hour, taking approximately half an hour after sunset. Uh, long exposure, we get the clouds moving. When you do long exposure, of course, the clouds will blur. Uh, we have good leading lines in here, and we also have an anchoring subject with good reflections. Uh, this one actually taken uh, near my home uh, in uh, central Pennsylvania. Again, not quite a 30 second exposure, but a long exposure it gives us the movement in the clouds. Long exposure also smooths out running water, as you can see here, and we get nice reflections from the lights on the bridge. Uh, anchoring here with the rocks and also framing with the, uh, the trees around here, it gives kind of causes the eye to just follow along here. You know, our, our normal inclination is to read from left to right, so our leading line follows us right here, the main subject being around this area here. And uh, the whole image seems to work. Here's a here's a shot we did of in Philadelphia, of course. Again, following a lot of the same rules, we have actually in, in this one we have almost two two main subjects here: the main city and of course the the, the high rise rising above the river here. Again, again, a lot of lines, a lot of geometry kind of force us into this area here, where the eye can rest. Uh, triangles also work to to try and bring you towards that uh, the center subject. Now here's one where I pretty much violate all the rule of thirds. Uh, this one commands the center of attention, uh, other than the, of course, the, the horizon line here in the sunset being the lower third. Uh, again, a very long exposure, again, to smooth out the river uh, where this boat is in the in the Philadelphia Navy Yard. This is the, actually the the carrier USS Kennedy, shot shot just beyond sunset, about 15 minutes after. Uh, again, uh, there were some cl the clouds work uh, mostly on the horizon. Again, gives us texture, gives us a, a, a the actual reflection here acts acts as our anchor point effectively, and uh, really a commanding image. Again, uh, uh, this is the George Washington Bridge heading over to New York, shot from the New Jersey side. Again, strong leading lines to our main subject, the first tower. Uh, clouds in the background accenting the back, anchoring to the shore here. Uh, this Again, this is the kind of thing that I'm looking for in a, in a good, strong image. And uh, of course, with the long exposure, the thing I'm always after, if I can get above the bridge road line, is the uh, the lights of the cars, the uh, what I call the trails of the lights. Again, with long exposure, it creates a nice effect. Um, just uh, uh, get, adds that color against the blue. Uh, really, really captures uh, the the moment here. Uh, same here with the Philadelphia skyline. This was. Uh, from one of the observation decks in, in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, the, again, rule of thirds, we have this here on the left. We have the, the foreground here, a uh, very strong image here, taking, taking command uh, with, the, with the sunset, again, 15 minutes. Uh, blue hour allows us to capture all the city lights uh, and still keep the details in the sky. Uh, this is the been, this is Philadelphia in the background, shot from New Jersey. This one not so much a long exposure. I think the shorter this one might have been only in the four to eight second range. Reason being, I wanted to get this good reflection here in in the bridge when I shot this. Uh, again, good leading lines, good anchoring, good skies. Uh, when in England, do as the British do, and that's to uh, uh, shoot their monuments. And this is what I did from the Thames River. A storm was coming in, uh, very, very fast moving clouds. Uh, the long exposure gives us that 
really super texture. Uh, again, the river was very, very rough with the winds coming up, but a long exposure smooths this down considerably. Again, we follow the rule of thirds, kind of putting this image in the upper right. So again, it all kind of worked. And I was lucky enough uh, to get this shot. And the bad news was I had to walk uh, about 10 minutes through the rain <laughs> to get back to the, uh, to the, to the tube after, uh, after we were done. Uh, one more shot of Philadelphia. Again, the, uh, uh, the blue hour lets us have the skies, lets us have the, uh, the skyline. A lot of good leading lines here between the rail, the bridge, the, the, the docks, getting us over to the, where I want to be here. Get the, we got a lot of cars here, a lot of street lights, all work to, to really create uh, uh, a lot of uh, things to, to where the eye could rest. Also, a lot of complementary colors between the blue skies and, and the redness and the warmth of the city. Uh, same here, movement, movement. I'm not going to belabor it. I think I've probably made my point 10 times over. But again, long exposure gives us the movement in the, in the, uh, in the uh, river here, as well as the clouds. And this was shot in South Korea. Uh, for those who like moonshots, this is what I'll do with the bridge. This is actually, uh, again, long exposure shot in wide angle, wide angle for the for this photograph. For the moon, I shot this in telephoto and ended up putting it back in because that's actually what I see uh, to uh, to create this image. But that uh, moon photography, that's a subject for a different webinar, so we'll just let that one go. Same here with the moon rise. This is actually a moon rise, not the sun. This is the moon rising off the east coast uh, near Ocean City, Maryland. Long exposure again, good leading lines with an anchoring of the fence line here. You'll see the how the waves are smoothed out to a kind of a milky texture. Uh, that's what the long exposures give you. Again, to capture the moon, no clouds. So. Anyway, let's cover some of the tools, techniques. I'll go through the equipment. Again, I've talked about composition tips uh, and some of the camera settings. I, I don't want this to be scary. Uh, it, it's really all easy, and it really it's a matter of practice uh, going out in, in those hours and just, just practicing and trying out different things. And that's how I ended up getting real good at it. It just took, took me a while to, to get the settings down and get the, uh, get the hang of of not pointing and shooting. But for equipment, any kind of, any of today's DSLRs or Miro's cameras will work quite nicely. The, the, anything that I'm talking about today will, can be shot in almost any of today's cameras. There's not going to be, uh, it doesn't have to be a lot of money spent on any kind of sophisticated equipment. Uh, it, it's all doable with what, what you probably have in your camera back right now. Uh, but the essential piece of equipment that not everybody will have and some people aren't comfortable with is the tripod. Uh, since the exposures are longer and since we're doing HDR bracketing, uh, a tripod is essential. Uh, all of the images I showed you earlier were all done on tripod. All of them were done. Each one of those pictures, by the way, is actually five exposures combined into one through high dynamic range processing. So uh, very important that you have the tripod, you set it up, uh, and then and that becomes our platform for, the, um, for our shoot. Uh, I recommend a strong tripod. Uh, you get some windy days out there, uh, and the very, very lightweight tripods just basically cause vibration, and you end up getting blurry images. So strong tripod, good head. Uh, don't have to spend a ton of money on these things. Uh, uh, a good strong aluminum tripod with a good head probably starts around $150 to $180. You could spend all the way up to three, four hundred dollars. Um, I have some friends who spend a lot more than that, but it's really not necessary. 
you'll also need a, either a remote shutter release or a setting on your camera where you don't uh, touch the camera after you've started your five exposures. On my Nikon, I can set mine for self-timer for five exposures, and I've set it to bracket, so my five exposures are done without a shutter release. But for most cameras, a shutter release is necessary, and the reason being, you don't want to touch your camera after you've made the setup. You you really don't want to for for HDR processing. You have to have five images that all line up together. So I recommend that once you've got the tripod set up, you've compositions ready, you've got your exposure settings good to go. Use a remote uh, to make your five exposures, or you uh, you touch your camera once through the shutter uh, for the uh, uh, self timer. Uh, this is me. One of the things that's very important, and I know it's it, it's it's uncomfortable for a lot of people, is but I like to. I am always in the manual mode. I've I've been shooting for many years now, and I don't even know I wouldn't know what to do in the automatic mode, to be honest. I'm always in the manual mode so I can control the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO, which I all manually set. Uh, this is very important also when we get into focusing as well, which I'll discuss in a few minutes. Focusing. I have my camera set for the back button focusing. Or you can turn your autofocus off after you are in focus. And what that means is if you're shooting five images bracketed, and you have your autofocus set through the shutter button, your camera will try and refocus every time for all of those five images. So what I do is I've set my camera to focus using the button next to the viewfinder. And I know it's pretty standard on Nikon. I'm almost certain it's the same on Canon and Fuji and Olympus where you set your back button to do the focusing and once you release the back button it'll stay focused again this is to prevent your camera from refocusing with each of the bracket in images i i consider this very important the first time i was uh, shooting or learning to shoot this method i found, found out i was having trouble with the focusing because it the, the darn thing kept trying to refocus every time and then once you get into dimmer and dimmer light the autofocusing gets trickier ISO. Uh, ISO gets back to the sensitivity of the exposure you're about to make. Uh, ISO runs from anywhere to a low one all the way to 50,000, 60,000, 100,000 ISOs. The newer cameras are coming out with amazing numbers. But the thing to remember is, of course, when you set to high ISO, the actual digital image becomes noisier. It picks up a lot of digital noise. That's why I always set my ISO for the lowest possible number. I, I love low ISOs. I wish they could even go lower, so I could go even longer exposures. Again, the lower the ISO, the longer you're going to have to uh, take the picture for, the longer exposure. But it creates very little noise when you get into the HDR processing. Bracketing. I keep talking about bracketing, and, and, and maybe that's uh, a lot of people might not understand what I mean by that. But bracketing is the technique where you're taking the same photo more than once using different expo different settings for different exposures. S Almost all of today's cameras will do it automatically for you when you set it up to do so. And as I mentioned, you want to set it, typically want to set up for five exposures, which would be one normal exposure, two overexposed, and two underexposed. And that's what, and this is all corrected when we do the HDR. Now, in bracketing, Basically, the, uh, when I say that uh, the, for the different exposures, 
it doesn't change the aperture. You'll set your aperture, which is either f5.6, f8, f11, whatever it may turn out to be, but the actual changing of the exposure will be done in the time of exposure. And I'll be showing that when we get to the practical demonstration, but typically if I set my camera for 15 seconds as the normal, my camera will then switch after each exposure. It'll go from 15 to 10 seconds to 8 seconds, then it'll go up to 20 and 30 seconds by itself, and it'll add up to almost a minute and a half of exposure. But this is the idea behind bracketing effectively. So it's each picture is a little bit different and adds a little uh, something that will will combine when we go into the HDR. Uh, here's a scary, scary slide for a lot of folks. This is the histogram. Uh, this is for advanced users, and, and I'm not going to get into explaining what all this means, but the most important thing to remember when we, if you do use histograms, and, and I use them all the time, is when you take a picture, you just make sure that you're not hitting the left wall and you're not hitting the right wall like you are here on this bottom image here. If you're hitting the left wall, it means you're probably too underexposed. If you're hitting the right wall, it means you have blowout in the highlights. It's overexposed. You try and get, we don't care what the shape of the curves are here. You'll have wacky curves. You can have a, a bell curve. But the important thing is to try and see a little bit of space here and here. And that means you got an image that we can work with. So don't there's people who live by histogram science and trying to control the red, green, blue histogram along all these various exposure uh, settings. I don't worry about that. I, I, in my viewfinder, I like to have the histogram on when I take the exposure and I just do a quick check to make sure I'm not overexposed or underexposed. So again, here's the, Here's an example of five bracket images. I've set my tripod up. I've gone ahead and started the exposure sequence to shoot five. So here we have the first one. This is just a little after sunset in, in York, Pennsylvania. And I've got one here at four seconds. Then after the four second shot is done, another one will be done at three seconds. The next one is two. Those are the normal exposure with the two underexposed shots. Then the camera switches over again automatically. It does the six second and the eight second. So you have a, a whole sequence of five pictures here, two, three, four, six, and eight, about just a little around 30 seconds of exposure. Now, when we go through HDR processing, we'll be getting this out of it. Right. Again, here's what 15 seconds look like with that bridge shot we started earlier. This is the Verrazano Narrows Bridge shot from Staten Island looking over to Brooklyn. There's the 10 second, a little darker than this one and the eight second, much darker than this one. Then we go into the higher exposures, the 20 second and the 30 second, a full range of bracketed images. And when we HDR processing, we'll be getting this. What I'll do now is I'm gonna switch over to PaintShop Pro and I'm gonna walk you through how I HDR these. So let's do a quick switch here. Here I am in Corel Paint Shop Pro, the 2020 Ultimate. This is may not look like your setup. It could look much different. This is the way I set up my edit window. I'm very minimalist. I, 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 I keep uh, my desktop very simple. Uh, and this way I can drag my images in as I need to. But to do what we'll do first, we're going to start with uh, the high dynamic range processing. So here's our main window, for our main edit window. I'm going to go up here to file. 
and it gives you the menu for creating new, new from the whole uh, range of menu options. And here, about two thirds of the way down, you see where it says HDR. Well, we're going to go across here to HDR, and what I'm going to be doing is an exposure merge. You don't have to worry about batch merge or loading an HDR file. This is something if you've started some work and haven't finished it. But what we'll do is an exposure merge. <clears throat> Now, it takes just a second for this to come up. It's a separate window within PaintShop Pro. And it comes up with a with a flashy little splash screen here, which we're going to get rid of. But this is the high dynamic range window. A lot of folks aren't familiar with this, but this is the initial window to start with. Now, what I have to do is I have to add those five images that we took earlier. I have a file set up, so here's that bridge shot that we saw, and here's the one of the courthouse. So what we'll do is we'll start with the bridge. I'm going to select the five images to import into this uh, package. So I've selected the five, and I'll hit open. And it puts them all here in the bottom tray. Now. I've already set my profile here for Nikon. You can pick any any of the popular cameras to get you set up for a profile. And they have something called here EV interval. That's the exposure value interval. I've set it for one. Uh, I would keep this number relatively low. I think they give you all sorts of options. You can go uh, 0.5. But once you get up to two, three, four, it's almost too much uh, uh, range and you really don't need that if you're keeping your uh, your original exposures tight uh, i would go with just a standard ev of one alignment what the software does it, it it will align your pictures if there's a slight misalignment between shots if you're shooting off a tripod you'll, you really won't have to worry about this too much but i would leave it at feature based so if, if there's a shift between two images it, the software will line up and make sure all five images are lined up on a, on a specific feature. Um, these are features I, I tend to uh, avoid. I'll do this when I edit later in the, in the main software package. But what I'm going to click now, the most important button here is process. So we, I pretty much left everything alone, and we're going to hit process. It's going to take the five images. It's combined them into an uh, high dynamic range photograph. Now over here it has a panel which gives you all sorts of prepackaged uh, options if you want and effects that are some are really crazy, some are pretty neat, others are uh, I like to avoid. <laughs> but the one I use the most in all my work it's it's almost always default to. It's probably the most natural color. Uh, I don't have to back off on the U too much when I when I use default to default one, a little too posterish. Uh, the problem a lot of people uh, uh, run into when they do HDR, it tends to look overdone. I like to try and keep it as natural as possible. Now with HDR, we've got the shadows here, the dark spots. We've got the bridge without blowing out some of the highs along here. So I'm going to hit process. And this takes about a minute. Uh, basically what it's doing, it's this is our preview image. It's going to combine all these images to create the final. There we go. Now this allows you to, uh, again, to make some rudimentary corrections in brightness, shadows, highlights. I mean, I'll, I'll show you, you know, it can bring up the, uh, basically the shadows, it basically lightens up the dark spots. Uh, I tend to, again, I, I tend to leave this alone. Let me get that back to zero. There we go. Uh, highlight saturation. I'll do this in the main in the main uh, package uh, of the of PaintShop Pro. I, I tend to leave all this alone. 
So this is the basic raw, Im what I call the raw image that I'm going to work with. I ignore all this. Uh, we can play with colors all day long, but it's just making the task much more difficult. So I'm going to do a save and close. Uh, I'm going to put this in a file of HDR, and we're going to save that. It gives you the warning. Again, no need to worry about that. And we're done. I'm going to do that one more time uh, using the the other image we had in that I saved up, and that's with the courthouse image, if you will. So I'll try and we'll walk through it very, very quickly. File, again, file, HDR, exposure merge. We're back. Drop that. Do the add here on the lower part of the screen. Again, I will pick these five images. You'll see that this is relatively quick. This is not, we barely two, three minutes and I'll have an HDR complete and ready. I hit the open. See how quick that was? I'm, since I'm all preset, I hit process. Again, it loads the defaults, all the default images here on the left. And again, I like default two as the most natural. Again, beauty of uh, blue hour photography, we still get those highlights in the skies. We get the, the lighting coming in on the buildings and we get the trails of the cars. Process that. There we go. And I'm just going to go right to save and close. And we are done. Now we're going to do our final edits. If I go to my file here, HDR, here's the two images that we've just created in the HDR. I'm going to drag this over to back into the main edit window. And this is where I like to work my magic. Not a lot to be done to this. It's really a, a very nice image. Uh, uh, I'm pleased with it, but the one there's a couple things that I'm picky about, and that just happens to be me. So uh, see, you'll see that this part turned out rather green. I'm going to put some red back in here because I like complementary colors. The sky turned out very nice. Uh, but again, I want to add something in the center here. So what I'm going to do is I go to the picking tool. Uh, I tend to pick manually if I can, free hand selection. So here I am, I'm going to pick. Uh, I'm going to just zoom in a little bit. I'm going to use this line here. So we'll start here. I pick here. I don't have to be too exact, but uh, the better, the closer, the better. And I right click and that picks that section right there. Now, since I want to also get over here, I'm going to press what's called the shift key on my keyboard because it's going to be a separate second selection. I'm pressing the shift key now on my keyboard and I'm starting another selection here. And I'm kind of walking through along here very fine, almost crazy fine, actually. All the way here, and I right click, and that finishes the selection. So now I have that section of lighting here on the bridge picked. I'm going to go to adjust, color, red, green, blue. Uh, oh, I had it pretty close to set here. I'm adding a lot of red, uh, no blue, no green. I think I'm going to just take away some blue to bring a little more yellow in there. There we go. There we are. So I have a high red, a little bit of reduction of blue, and hit OK. And I think what I want to do is just kind of uh, saturate it, perhaps. I just want to see what it looks like saturated. I go to Adjust, 
this time U in saturation. I'll go to U saturation lightness. That reduces it. Let's see, and I, I'll ignore, let's move this over a little bit so you can see it. I don't play with the U, I don't play with the lightness. I just use the saturation slider right here. And you'll see I put a little more red in there. Here's what it looks like before. Just a little bit of saturation in there. And I'll also, one more thing I like to do, adjust, is the brightness and contrast to that area. Let's move that. And this time I'm just going to go a little darker and add a little contrast to it again. There we go. Selections. Now that I've done the corrections to that area, I'll hit selections, none. And there I have that. I would probably make this, if I do it all over again, I'd probably make this just slightly less red. But uh, again, it's a nice effect, complementary to the blue. Uh, I don't want the eye to concentrate too much on the trees. Uh, the HDR picks up a little bit of, uh, kind of lighten some of the background lighting here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick my darkening tool. Uh, and I'm going to go, right now that's a size 600 that creates that circle. I'm going to go 1200. Like that. Uh, now with this particular shading, if I hit the left button, it will lighten it. If I hit the right button on my mouse, it will darken it. See, there's a lighter. I don't want to do that. Let's get rid of that. But I do want to darken it a little bit. I'm going to, let's see here. I'm having a little trouble. There we go. Kind of darken this area. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, go a little higher density. I'm having, excuse me one second here. Let me just tweak. There we go. That's darkening. And I don't want this to be the prominent feature. I just want this to be there. That's it. I don't want the, uh, I don't want the, uh, I don't want to take away from the bridge. Now, one thing I'll also do here. I'm going to lighten this tower a little bit. So I'm using my selection tool again. I'm going to go just like from this point here all the way up, across, across, here, oh, run into a little bit of a boo-boo. There we go. Yezo. I'm going to walk around the bridge to the bottom base of the tower. Oop. Had a little bit of problem there, but got around it. Adjust. I'm going to put a, make that a little lighter, so I'm just going to do a quick adjustment. Adjust. The one you can use brightness contrast here, but what I like to do is fill light, and I usually use between 30 and 40 as my magic number. And you'll see how I've done a little of a filler there on the bridge, just again to bring that bring that out. I'm also going to just put a little contrast in it so it doesn't look wa completely washed out. So brightness, contrast, and it will be a minimalist. I'll just go minus five about on the brightness and plus five on the contrast. Again, let's do a preview. Just a little bit, just to add some contrast to it. Okay, select none. And there we pretty much have uh, uh, getting closer to a finished image. The one thing sometimes I do 
to a number of my images, I'll do what's called, again, going to brightness contrast. This is something you may or may not want to do, but under there, I've, we've used brightness contrast, we've used fill light. Sometimes I'll add a little local tone mapping. It tends to, to give it a little bit of a extra pizzazz. Typically, I'll you never run it more than one through five. Again, preview. Just puts a little more contrast in the overall image. And there you have it. That's what it looks like. We've, we've captured the clouds, we've captured the bridge. Again, that's, that's just long exposures uh, from our five bracketed images. Uh, I'll do the same thing very quickly with the, uh, the other shot we have. I'm gonna say goodbye to that. We go back to HDR. Here's the courthouse shot we did earlier. I'll walk through it very quickly in review. There's our courthouse. Not bad coloration. Needs a little bit, the building probably could use a little bit of brightening here. I'm gonna use my manual pick tool. Uh, let's see here. I think I'll do things in reverse a little bit. I'm gonna do, go to brightness and contrast, do a quick local tone mapping, see what we get here. Darkens it a little bit. Let's run that up to five. Can't be too aggressive with this. There we go. About a two. Yeah. There we go. There's that. I'm going to go to the selection tool because I want the building to be a little lighter to stand out. So let me just zoom in a little bit. I just walk around the building, kind of picking my points. I'll walk around some of the brighter objects. I don't really need to lighten them up at all. The picking tool does a nice job of, of finding edges. I use this pretty consistently. Again, for this exercise, I'd probably go into a lot more detail. Uh, but for here, I just want to demonstrate how to just kind of walk around. Uh, yeah, we'll do this right here. Right click and it makes finalizes the selection. I'm going to go to adjust brightness contrast and I'm going to do another fill light on that one. Just to put a little more light into the building, make it stand out a little more. Go about 50. Selection's done. Uh, and uh, there. I think that looks like a pretty good start. I probably. If, again, for my personal work, I'd probably do a little bit of cropping maybe to cr or cloning even to get this building out. Matter of fact, I'll just do a quick demo of that. I'm gonna, I don't like this one corner of the building sticking in my picture. I'm going to go to about a 400 on my cloning tool. I'm going to pick a line right here. The new cloning tool is quite nice because it gives you an image, shows you how it's going to look. I'm going to get rid of that line. Right, like this, like that. I'm going to try and hide this building a little better here. I'm going to go shrink that cloning down, down to 100. I'm, I just doing a quick here, just a quick walkthrough, making this building go away. And, I, and I'll do some other blending of the background here. I'm not going to finish this photograph today. It's going to get a little boring for you. So, But I would also get rid of some of this and probably cut it off at that line there through this courtyard here. But at least that's not dominating my image there. And there we have a, a courthouse shot uh, just uh, again after sunset uh, using the HDR techniques I've discussed. And that, I believe, is the end of my presentation. Carly, can I turn it over to you?
Yes, thank you so much, George. That was an excellent presentation. And thank you to everyone uh, for joining this webinar today. We hope you really enjoyed it as well. I just wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for the follow-up email you'll receive tomorrow. Uh, that email will include an exclusive 25% discount offer to the upgrade or purchase of PaintShop Pro 2020 Ultimate, as well as a link to the recording of this webinar to watch again as you please. Thanks again to everyone and have a great day.